Hello, everybody. Welcome to the last in our spring 2022 Exploring Research Seminars, The Visual Regime of Medicine in Late Colonial India with Dr. Apurba Chatterjee. Thanks for joining us live today. My name is William Schubbach. I'm a member of the research development team here at Wellcome Collection. I'm currently sitting in a bunker-like meeting room in the Wellcome Trust's high-tech headquarters building on Euston Road in London at tea time on a Tuesday afternoon in April. As the title of the series suggests, these seminars explore current research that relates to our collections, which focus on the social and cultural contexts of health. In the spring program, we focus on the period after 1850. For previous seminars in the program, please see the Welcome Collection events page on the Welcome Collection website, and a link will be shown in the chat. Before I introduce our speaker, I just want to mention some housekeeping rules. The session will run for one hour. Our presenter, Dr. Apurba Chatterjee, will share a presentation with us for around 40 minutes, after which there will be an opportunity to ask questions via the YouTube chat. So please post your questions in the YouTube chat throughout the presentation, and all questions will be anonymized in the recording. I will facilitate questions at the end. If Apoba doesn't have time to answer them all, don't worry, we will send them on to her and she will attempt to respond in due course. This session is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent out via Eventbrite after the event. If you're not a regular user of Eventbrite, you may find that this email has gone into your spam or junk folder, so be sure to check that. And we will also post the link on the Welcome Collection Researchers Network page, WCRN, which is on Facebook, for which you're all welcome to join. And you can find us under the description in Facebook, WCRN Network. And through this network, we distribute information about our activities. And a link to this will also be found in the chat. This event is being captioned live, should you wish to see the text and it is being streamed live to YouTube, where you can watch it again immediately after the event finishes. A brief feedback questionnaire will be sent out with the recording link after the event, where you can tell us what you think of the event. A link to it will also be available in the chat at the end of this session. We'd be very grateful if you could take the time to fill this out to let us know how we're doing, what sort of research you're interested in hearing about, and how we might improve the sessions in future programs. And the questionnaire includes an opportunity to sign up to the Welcome Collection Researchers Network. So now to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Apurba Chatterjee. Apurba is a Welcome Trust Research Fellow in Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Reading. She received her PhD in History at the University of Sheffield in 2020, for a thesis on the relationship between visual arts and political legitimacy in the early British Indian Empire. And she's broadly interested in the cultural politics of British imperialism and is currently researching the visual regimes of medicine in late colonial India with a focus on malaria. So over to you, Apurba. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, thank you very much for joining me today. I would also like to take this opportunity to extend my heartfelt gratitude to Julia for inviting me and for William for his very kind introduction. Many thanks also to the technical team here at Welcome for their support. So as William said, my name is Apoorba Chatterjee. I am an Indian woman with black hair. I come from the biggest city in the eastern part of the country, which is Kolkata. And many of you might be familiar with Kolkata as Calcutta, as it was known during the British rule. I'm wearing a sari today, which is the traditional outfit worn by women throughout India. I'm a historian of the British Empire, as William already said, with a specific interest in the cultural politics of imperialism and its legacies in the present times. This afternoon, I have the pleasure to address you on the Welcome Collection. 
Although I'll begin by introducing my own current research on the visual culture of malaria in India, uh, this will largely be a stepping stone to think about the vast range of visual material that the Welcome Collection has made available digitally, which I hope might help generate interest, not only in the fascinating varieties of artifacts themselves, but also the stories they tell and how those can be made more responsive to our own times. So uh, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, in 1903, when Henry Solomon Welcome had first planned the exhibition of the artifacts that he had voraciously collected, he had not intended it to be open for the public. Instead, Welcome had aimed it for medical doctors and specialists as part of establishing himself his own professional identity in the field. Welcome, however, had taken a holistic approach. Not only was he interested in the medical instruments, but he also found uh, delight in painting statues, scrolls, material, uh, which probably nowadays would not appear as directly for, to interest, uh, directly interesting for the scientist in the first place, because these few these uh, artifacts would be largely related to uh, like the fields of humanities, for example. So Welcome was a believer in Christian moral and civilizational ideals, and the display of his collection was based on a historical progressivist and evolutionistic rhetoric. Welcome benefited from imperial networks and echoed the contemporary models of world fairs and colonial exhibitions based on racial hierarchization. Colonial archives are known to have favored the colonizer over the colonized. This is especially true as historians have tended to prefer written material over other kinds of evidence. Steadfast adherence to facts as culled from official textual sources gave expression to this approach. The idea of the colonized nations as devoid of a historical past, or at least not one that could be properly known or interpreted by the people of those lands, became part of an aggressive imperialist agenda that glorified the role of its own actors as harbingers of modernity. In recent years, digitization has increasingly been understood as an important force in writing this imbalance. Uh, in fact, digitization is viewed as a means to bring to the fore the voices of the colonized that have hitherto remained unheard. Digitization thus gives expression to alternative worldviews and perspectives which are crucial to decolonizing our mindset and our scholarship at large. Efforts and initiatives on the part of the Welcome Trust to take the decolonial agenda forward are worthy of appreciation. Within its physical exhibitions, both permanent and temporary, the Welcome Trust has successfully built in the notions of sensitivity and accountability regarding our shared past and its not so rosy aspects. My aim today is to think closely about the digital side of the story with a specific focus on visual imagery. Speaking of visual imagery in relation to colonial science, I do not think it would be out of place to begin with none other than Henry Welcome himself. So on the left side of your screen, now you have a cartoon of Welcome as a mosquito from the early 20th century. Indeed, this was the age when the mosquitoes kind of gained in esteem, identified, being identified as like rather so I should use notoriety rather than esteem, because uh, they were identified as the vector of a host of tropical diseases, including malaria. On the right hand side, you have a caricature again, this time show, showing, showing Louis Sambon. And here you also have Ronald Ross, um, like in, in one of the figures on the stick. Uh, he was the Donald Ross was the surgeon major at the Colonial Indian Medical Service responsible for detecting mosquitoes as the vector of the malarial parasite between human bodies. I wanted to show these images together as these help us build a narrative of the welcome's connection with tropical medicine and in turn with India. Louis Sambon was a uh, associated with the London School of Tropical Medicine and was engaged by works Henry Welcome as a collector. Collecting imperialism and materiality are thus all brought together in these two images. So Burroughs Welcome was very much involved in marketing and selling quinine in India, which was the remedy of malaria. And Welcome also invested significantly in research on tropical medicine. So I'll be addressing, can we, can we move to the next slide, please? 
I will be addressing the visual regime of colonial medicine today in three stages. At the very outset, I'll be focusing on the images as part of scientific research. Thereafter, I'll try to move on to, uh, to, to explore the relationship between images and uh, the British Indian administration. And finally, I'll focus on the images and the vernacular, thereby thinking about visual imagery as part of the everyday life in colonial India. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. Great. So researching on malaria, Ross was desperate to see the unseen, as reflected in his verse in exile that he actually wrote the time when he was conducting his malarial research. I pray thee, truth, control, my destiny distraught, and move my sightless soul in thy high ways of thought. Can we move to the next slide, please? By truth, here he means the great scientific truth behind the cause of malaria that he was after. According to Ross himself, his research remarkably transformed when he started to use the microscope properly in the 1890s. Since his discovery, visualization became an important part of his self-presentation, as can be inferred from him being seated with a microscope on his table. Uh, Ross had uh, considered his malarial experiments to be a visual revelation, which as he exclaimed in his very famous Nobel lecture, ended for me at least the old research, the period of doubt, the groping in the dark, the secret spring had been touched, the door flew open, and the path led onward full in sight, and it was obvious that science and humanity had found a new dominion. Ross used drawings to communicate his research findings, first to Patrick Manson, a pioneer of tropical medicine, and later to Alphonse Laveran. Uh, de dependence on illustrations is clearly visible in Ross's patron, uh, Ross's uh, mentor Manson's work as well. Manson's fascination with the malarial parasite's life cycle was an important attempt to trace the beast that harbored in the mosquito. The visual documentation of this beast, that is the malarial parasite, was thus the first step to know and understand it, thereby laying the foundation for mastering it. Drawing on Manson, uh, Ronald Ross used illustrations extensively. Located afar in India, drawings of the parasite as present inside the mosquitoes made his research findings visible and also brought his textual explanations alive. Uh, drawings sent by Ross enabled Manson to communicate the former findings, the former his own findings to the scientific community in Britain. Thus, uh, the drawings have had two functions. They confirmed Ross's claim of the mosquito as the vector of malaria. And second, uh, these drawings basically served as a guidance for how and where to can detect the parasite in the mosquito. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. So as we can see uh, here on the images on your screen, the visual representation of mosquito and the life cycle of the parasite became the order of the day. At the center, you have the life cycle of Plasmodium as reproduced in Ronald Ross's memoirs. On the left-hand side of the screen, you have the images of the Anopheles mosquitoes, the vector of malaria, which were produced. Uh, these images were produced in the Wellcome Research Laboratory at Gordon Memorial Hospital in Khartoum. On the right-hand side, you have the image of a mosquito showing the signs of a blood meal uh, from the Journal of Hygiene published from Cambridge. The interest in the anatomy of the mosquito and the observation of the development of parasite actually hint at links between science and visualization that reached its apex in the uh, practice of natural history in the 18th century. So next we will be looking at some natural history images on the next slide, please. Okay, so in fact, what uh, we don't really uh, think about much when thinking about Ross and his association with visuality is that Ross himself was an amateur artist. He had grown up surrounded by his mothers and aunts who were very fond of uh, botanical drawings. Uh, Patrick Manson believed, uh, Patrick Manson, Ross's mentor, believed that a, a practitioner of medicine ought to be a naturalist in the first place. So Patrick Manson always advised uh, Ronald Ross to look for the ideal, uh, the way, uh, ideal manners of like depicting the parasite. And this, I, this search for the ideal is very much 
uh, part of the natural history illustrations, European tradition of natural history illustrations that reached its apex in the 18th century, basically. So Ross uh, also took an avid interest as proven by his draft of an illustrated volume of natural history based on the works uh, on the books from the library of Reverend Henry Wood and the works of famous uh, 18th century naturalists Georges Cuvier and Comte Buffon, uh, which were lent to him by his uncle Wilmot. So Ross cherished his relationship with Wilmot and admired his passion for science. His association with Wilmot actually made Ross believe more in the role of the public in shaping science. And uh, this connection was actually instrumental in his own efforts, in his own attempts to make medical research more public facing. And that is something which in which we differed from um, Manson. So Ross was very eager to communicate his findings to the public. And that is something that he harps on a lot uh, through, uh, throughout his memoirs. So let's look at some of those natural history illustrations on the screen. So on the top left hand side, you have the image of a mosquito by a Dutch physician named Jan Swamedam. It, it is dated around 1669. This atten minute attention to detail as seen in the image was something that was to be useful later as we saw like in case of malarial imagery to like a detailed location of uh, detailed understanding of the anatomy of the mosquito as well as the parasite within the mosquito and the different stages of the growth of the mosquito. So below on the left, you have the representation of five water, water beetles on a fruit plant from Dutch artist Maria Sevilla Merian, uh, whose work was, uh, is titled Metamorphosis based on the, so this work is actually based on the depiction of insects in, in Dutch Suriname. Such strategies of observation were increasingly useful in the colonial context of commercial and political dominance and appropriation. Next, we have a cluster of insects as represented in an English translation of Comte Buffon's Natural History. Works of Buffon were clear, were really relevant in the context of British Indian Empire, where British patrons often delegated the task of producing natural history illustrations to local native artists, as the traveling British artists, uh, like who came to came to visit India, uh, did not consider such artistic commissions worth their while. Within the corpus of Indian art for the British, which was previously known as the Company Schools, Book School of Painting, but now we know it as um, Indian Export Art, natural history images are quite prominent. However, Indian artists were given European illustrated volumes of natural history, like that of uh, Comte, Buffon, Comte de Buffon's to uh, basically follow as models. If we could move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, next, we have the images of a lizard, a snake, and a beetle painted by Bhavani Das, who was one of the three artists working for Lady Mary Empe, the wife of Sir Eliza Empe, the first judge of first chief justice of the Supreme Court of Judicature in Calcutta. So uh, basically, Lady Empe used to give her artists the works by Buffon to follow as models. That's why I'm trying to make a direct connection on here. So the idea of detachment, as is evident in these paintings, because these are all species in focus without any uh, hint of their surroundings or any environment as such, like in which these species might have been found or anything. So uh, one thing that uh, is often noted is that Lady Impe used to pay a lot of attention uh, to the, the, the environmental conditions within which a species of plant or animal could be located, but such kind of information did, did not uh, like, uh, did not seem to have reflected much when it comes to the visuals being prepared for her. So uh, Lady Impe had basically more than 300 life-size paintings of Indian flora and fauna made for her from 1774 to 1783, because that's the year in 1783, basically she left for Britain with her husband. These images form an exception within the canon of Indian painting for the British, as these are signed paintings. The majority of Indian artists working for the British basically remain anonymous because most of these paintings are unsigned. The paintings that Lady Empe brought back with her proved to be very useful for uh, British naturalists like Thomas Pennant, for example, for his views 
of uh, Hindustan, for his book, Views of Hindustan. So now let's move on to the next half of my presentation. Could we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so uh, the discovery of mosquitoes as the vector of malarial parasite encouraged the colonial government to turn its attention to Indian environment afresh. So as Ron Woodross uh, himself had pointed out, malaria is the chief, uh, is the greatest enemy of the explorer, the missionary, the planter, the merchant and the farmer, the soldier, the administrator, the villager, the poor, pretty much everyone, and has profoundly modified the world's history by tending to render the whole of the tropics comparatively unsuitable for the full development of civilization. The idea of locating the breeding grounds of mosquitoes in pools, marshes, swamps, and paddy fields became one of utmost importance as part of direct action in terms of public health, uh, basically. So drawing and microscopic photography became integral part of the colonial administrative malaria surveys that uh, flourished in the early 20th century. And the surveyors were always advised to keep drawing books photographic material and pencils with them on site. Thus imaging was kind of indispensable to the whole process. So this is actually quite uh, evident from uh, the next image that we are going to see. So we have uh, the image of uh, an image from uh, SR uh, Christopher's how to do a malaria survey on the left hand side of the screen. So understanding the anatomy, understanding of the anatomy of the mosquito and how the parasite harbored within the mosquito's body, as we can see, are again prioritized here. Thus, knowledge would now be used to catch mosquitoes on a much larger scale than Ross had attempted for his experiments in order to now get rid of them, of course. Next, we find Ronald Ross as catching mosquitoes with a net, it's like a caricature again, perhaps as indicative of the mosquito brigades that he had helped organize. And underneath the first cartoon, you have another one. So that, uh, that uh, and that actually represents uh, uh, Ronald Ross as wearing a high, wearing Highland dress, a testimony to his Scottish identity. Together with his bagpipe, he has oil and fish as destroyers of mosquito lava. Uh, illustrations are indicative of the context in the early decades of the 20th century, in which governmental efforts to disseminate diagrams via school textbook posters and manuals about the etiologies of malaria among the colonized South Asians were basically, was basically being attempted. So Patrick Heher, the surgeon at uh, Indian Medical Service was one of the, one among many senior uh, colonial officials who recommended the images of the malarial parasite and the female anopheles to be used in vernacular posters for teaching in schools. So we can see that images are very, very important from the perspective of the colonial government's efforts against malaria as well, uh, not just in order to combat uh, the mosquitoes um, as basically vectors of the parasite, but also generate awareness uh, about the same. So this, uh, can we move to the next slide, please? So this attention to the Indian environment as part of surveillance against malaria basically echoed the rhetoric of improvement as prevalent in the 18th century. So nowadays, like with changing scholarship on malaria, we have this idea of seeing that how the metaphors of war and the, how the metaphors of somebody being a soldier against malaria is very, very prominent. And one of the very important connections in terms of art that I would like to make here is that like, uh, it was uh, the soldiers who probably made the first, uh, like, uh, uh, who pro uh, produced the first representations of uh, landscapes in India. So one of the most prominent ones was Francis Wayne Ward, who gifted his paintings uh, based on Southern India to the East India Company. And Ross's own father was also uh, very fond of painting landscapes and Ross remembers it a lot throughout uh, his own uh, writings basically. So this idea of uh, improvement which was very very central to the 18th century uh, an important aspect of this ideal was basically the aesthetic of the picturesque which while celebrating the decadence and roughness of Indian landscapes of those as in need 
of improvement and transformation that only the British could actually bring in. So this is something which is interesting. Uh, for me, it was very interesting because when I basically typed in the search word mosquito uh, on the welcome uh, like image website, welcome website, many of the things that came up basically were like these images of landscapes. So that actually uh, makes sense uh, in terms of like the rhetoric of uh, like improvement as such and uh, how that basically continued within the official mentality. So returning to the point that I was basically trying to make. So on your screen now you have three aquitans from William Hodges, who was the first professional landscape uh, artist to basically travel to India in the later half of the 18th century. He was patronized by none other than Warren Hastings, the first governor general of India. So Warren Hastings uh, like uh, basically was very fond of Hodges' own agenda, and Hodges also tried to cause, uh, tried to basically promote Hastings' cause and like basically um, like sing its praises literally. So uh, on your left hand side, you first have the image of uh, a view of uh, the Kachra, uh, which is uh, like some religious buildings in Mushidabad, Maksudabad. There, like the title says Maksudabad, but it's actually. Mushidabad. So um, Mushidabad was the capital of Bengal before Calcutta and Warren Hastings was actually quite responsible in shifting the center of power from Mushidabad to Calcutta. And here like Hodges has depicted that entire area in a state of decadence and obviously a picture of decline is very much prevalent here. So if we could then move on to the slide, move on to another image on the same slide, we have the Fort of Gwalia, uh, like just on your right hand side below. So that also has this ruggedness and this kind of uh, uh, ruggedness and decadence, which is very, very much part of the picturesque ideal that had also developed in the later half of the 18th century and actually was quite like took a very interesting experiment, like uh, expression in the colonial context, like depictions by the river that we, as we can see in the case of the Katra. And these are quite important. So another, like, uh, I think one of the aquatins that actually talks about this rhetoric of the picturesque and the whole idea of the British improvement of Indian life is that of the illustration, the that of the aquatint uh, above that of the fort of Gwalia that we are going to see, the one just next uh, up, up on the right hand side. So here we basically have the view of a farmland in the Kingdom of Bengal by Hodges, which is dated like 1786. It presents the Bengal countryside in a state of calm and quietude. A woman is being shown as carrying a pitcher of water over her head, while two children and some men are in a relaxed state. The village culls under the tree beside the hut. The village culls are present under the tree beside the hut. And the presence of goats and cows in the scene add to the general peace that this representation evokes. This image does not even uh, give a hint of the devastating impacts of the long-term effects of the Bengal famine of the 1770s and those of the land revenue experiments on the part of the East India Company throughout the mid 1770s and in the 1780s. Furthermore, it does not register and thereby tries to neutralize the dangers of peasant rebellions in this period continuing well into the 19th century. The British obsession with settled agriculture, which also was seen by South Asians as one of the agents of uh, basically uh, like generating malaria, the British obsession with um, like uh, improvement of land and settled agriculture under the management of landowners, influenced by the, by the culture of physiocracy, found expression in the permanent uh, settlement of 1793. Under this measure, although the permanent ownership of land on the part of land laws was secured, this guarantee came at the cost of exorbitant rates of land revenue, the pressure of which actually the peasants had to bear. Uh, the 
emergence of absentee landlordism as an outcome of permanent settlement was a departure from an earlier age when the landlords took a direct interest in the upkeep and welfare of peasants. The pastoral evocations of this scene contributes to an image of peace and harmony, which the image uh, basically represents as the obvious outcomes of the British political presence in India. Observed from a distance, the village life in India is idealized in this image. And this idealization had not only elided the British impact on Indian economy, but also presented a state of calm that in reality did not exist. The idea of the prosperity of India's countryside under the British rule was a chimera. And these imaginings were actually very, very central to the later assumption of India being a land of villages and basically glorifying glorifications on that account, which obviously the nationalistic side, national, nationalists also take up in their own way. But these imaginings are really part of this 18th century visual rhetoric. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. So the image of decadence and the, the need for improvement, as we had seen in the images by Hodges, are also present here. So on your left hand side, you see an aquatint of uh, gore, basically, by uh, James Moffat. And uh, this is really interesting and because of the fact that these give an image of declining of a declining culture and then on the other hand you have the representation of a key rock by Thomas Daniel from his oriental scenery and these kinds of ruggedness the representation along the river are like very very central to the whole idea of um, how the British visualized India and what they wanted India to look like basically to an audience back home. And um, that's how it's really relevant to think about these illustrations as such. So let's move on to the next section. So can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, so moving on to uh, this section, it would now be pertinent to turn our attention towards South Asian visual culture. So let's start with the image on the right hand side, basically. So here you have a cartoon from the Bengali medical periodical Swastya Samachar, which literally means news on healthcare. And this is dated 1916. Bengali medical periodicals, such uh, as medical manuals, emerged in the British colonial period. And by the early 20th century, they integrated concerns of health and hygiene with the agenda of regional South Asian nationalism. An article published in Swastya Samachar in the same year, for instance, had argued that while the people of Bengal were concerned about the First World War. They were oblivious of the detriments of malaria, which were at the root of the socioeconomic disaster and disorder in their own land. This cartoon is captured as Joy Malaria Joy, which actually means Hail Malaria in English, and is set in an urban context. Uh, it depicts malaria as death. And here you have that figure of the dance of death, which is very much uh, visible in the European artistic canon, stepping on a fallen, ailing female embodiment of Bengal, of Bengal. And this is like this nationalistic, anthropomorphic representation of homeland as a Hindu mother goddess that had become increasingly popular by the beginning of the 19th century, starting with uh, Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay's Anandamat, basically. And, uh, so this dance of death has already stepped on the represent female embodiment of Bengal, and it's now making its way to the region as uh, represented by a map underneath. So in the right hand side of death is an Indian lance or a borsha, and instead of scythe, which is actually its usual accoutrement. So this is with a banner that says in sanitation, surrounded by a swarm of mosquitoes, that is the insect vectors of malaria. On the left hand side, the scenes, there are scenes of death and debility as people suffering from malaria, like the female figure representing Bengal, are evident from the protuberance of their stomach, that is the enlarged spleen, basically representing an enlarged meal, spleen, helplessly witnessing the scourge of the disease taking over Bengal. On the right hand side, there are members of the Bengali elite known as the Bhadrolok, who seem to be ignoring and looking away from the ongoing crisis. 
just behind the elite stands a neoclassical building with the word indifference. I think the pun is kind of intended here, engraved on the top because like the, there, uh, the spelling is wrong. Obviously, the colonial government was indifferent to the Indian problems of malaria and thus wasn't doing the right thing in the first place. So there are clouds in the backdrop, uh, which appear as bats, adding to the further ominous character of this portrayal. Uh, images like this are illustrative of how the apparently unconnected artistic and intellectual worlds of laboratory science, governance, and vernacular periodicals were entangled because of their shared concerns for public health and links to the environment. This image, which was published in the middle of the First World War, brings to attention how Bengali public commentators use malaria as an occasion to critique the colonial uh, apathy, as well as uh, certain sections of the South Asian Bhadralok nationalists. The image alleges that even as malaria thrives on insanitation and vanquishes the female personification of Bengal who languishes on the ground, the colonial government, represented by the imposing uh, building with uh, of uh, built in building in neoclassical style is displaying indifference while the Bhadralok nationalists are actually looking away so that is something which is uh, like it is bringing different diverse worlds on visual commentaries on malaria as such as we can see here so on your right hand side like uh, you have another cartoon and this is this takes word the, the criticism of the philandering bengali elite and this is a, a cartoon by uh, Gaganendranath Tagore, the nephew of Ravindranath Tagore, the first uh, Nobel laureate of Asia. So uh, Gaganendranath Tagore basically represents, again, this is supposedly uh, the, the figure represented here is the Maharaja of Bardhuan. So even malaria and insanitization are also featured in the image. And the scourge of disease, as seen in the previous image, are also prevalent here. And Maharaja of Bardhuan, instead of basically uh, donating for these causes was basically and warding off these uh, like uh, begging hands as we can see in the picture and uh, like instead of helping better the cause of uh, the people at large he's like warding people away so he's indifferent to the question uh, of malaria as such and that is what uh, is being mocked at here. So at the center of the slide, we kind of have my favorite image. Apparently this uh, might appear as unrelated to what I'm trying to discuss here. However, the style, the title of the image reads, they fought for a year in the stomach of the mosquito. And this is part of the folk tales of Hindustan, which was published in 1913. This image is indicative of Indian awareness of the mosquito's anatomy. The idea of the parasite as maturing inside the gut of the mosquito here has been transformed into that of conflict, conflict between two social groups, the peasantry and the exploitative money lender. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. So now we are going to think a little bit more like we wouldn't be talking on this about on this slide about malarial image as such, but we will try to uh, think a little bit closer about the um, like uh, the belief system surrounding diseases uh, and uh, diseases in India, basically. So we here have on the left hand side, goddess Sitala, literally the cool one, who is understood to be the presiding goddess of smallpox and other epidemics. The, this figure, the figure directly associated with fevers in Bengal is the demigod or demon, uh, Jwaras, uh, Jwarasura. Uh, I haven't been able to find any of his images as yet. His statues exist, but I haven't been able to find any of his images yet. So I'm um, still looking for that actually. I hope I do find it in course of my research. So within uh, Indian society, therapeutics are steeped in culture and worship of deities to propitiate them, them during the times of epidemics does not necessarily mean not taking steps for treatment. Uh, here we have see, seen that Sitala, goddess Sitala is riding a donkey, her vahana, as we call in Hinduism. So. In fact, uh, donkey's milk has been used as a treatment for and prevention against viruses during the months of spring in rural Bengal. And in addition to being uh, 
in addition to being offered um, during the worship of Goddess Shitala as well. So in uh, like the European association with the donkey's milk, basically I think like uh, the closest association that might come is like Cleopatra used to bathe in the donkey's milk, but this kind of a system is like really therapeutic and uh, quite uh, cardinal to like uh, traditional belief systems basically. And that is something that I'm trying to uh, highlight here. So the idea of deities as battling and vanquishing diseases is again visible in the next image of goddess uh, Durga as slaying demon Koronasura, a COVID-19 embodiment of the demon Mahishasura. So this image uh, was uh, like, uh, this, is in, this image is from uh, a celebration in the northern part of Bengal that became popular uh, in, uh, throughout the country and abroad as well. The image that I have presented here is from the Guardian basically. So the Guardian also took up this uh, very interesting and I think quite uh, endearing image as well. So here, Goddess Durga is dressed as a doctor with a stethoscope and instead of her weapons is shown as maneuvering a syringe that is indicative of the vaccination against COVID-19. So vernacular images of these kind are as they were in the past, an important means of generating awareness against diseases and especially relevant during the times of the pandemic. So like one of the things that uh, like uh, comes up a lot, like in the wake of the COVID-19 and everything is like how traditional societies have generated awareness and beliefs and uh, like uh, regarding the disease. And so uh, these examples are like, important uh, too for us to understand as we are still kind of living through uh, a global pandemic. So let's turn our attention back to the images again of uh, like something uh, that I have been investigating so far. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, the agency of insects and the natural world became increasingly potent within the scientific and literary communities uh, in both in India and Britain during the 20th century. Within the South Asian vernacular context, Western influences of science and natural history came to be adapted to the traditional understandings of life and culture. It is to this end that I will now show you some of the Indian works of art, which I obviously find very, very fascinating. So let us start with the Kalighat painting of Hanuman on the left-hand side of the slide. And Hanuman is basically known to the Western audience as the monkey god. So Kalighat is a religious site in the southern part of Calcutta or Kolkata, uh, devoted to the worship of mother goddess Kali. In the 19th century, there developed a style of painting primarily aimed, as pil aimed at pilgrims and visitors at the temple of Kali. And these pilgrims and uh, visitors used to buy these paintings as souvenirs. So this painting of Hanuman is interesting as it combines two different aesthetic traditions, basically. So Hanuman here is shown as revealing the presence of Lord Rama and his wife Sita within his heart. And this association is part of the 16th century retelling of the epic Ramayana, that is the tale of Rama. So the reference here is from the chapter Sundarkand in Ramayan, Ramayan where, uh, which is actually a glorifying account of the deeds of uh, Hanuman in the service of his Lord Ram. So, uh, so there is a particular poem in uh, within Sundar Khan, which is called in the uh, in the praise of Hanuman, which is called Hanuman Chalisa. And Hanuman Chalisa actually has this line, Ram Lakhan Sita Man Basia. And this line is in Avadhi, which actually is a dialect of Hindi. And this line literally means that Ram Lakshman, who is the brother of Ram, and Sita, Ram's wife, basically reside in the heart of Hanuman. This deeply religious association, however, has been expressed here in a European natural historical mode. The representation of Hanuman strongly echoes the uh, depictions of monkeys and gibbons by Bengali artist Halodar, produced for Francis Buchanan Hamilton, a Scottish naturalist who is known for his authoritative surveys of Bengal and Mysore. 
On the left hand side of the slide, you have another Palekhat painting. This time, the representation of a fish and a lobster, perhaps influenced again by the illustrations of fishes produced by Indian artists for Buchanan Hamilton. These images, like these, are uh, like you, Buchanan Hamilton's archive is now part of the Linnean Society in London. So, Western artistic, including natural historical conventions, influenced the narrating and retelling of Indian tales and traditions, which reached out to audiences beyond India. At uh, the center of the slide, you have a painting of Raja Ravi Verma. And Ravi Verma was somebody who was taking part a lot in these colon in colonial exhibitions and uh, drawing and painting contexts, in contests. And he actually ended up winning many of these. So. Uh, so this painting by Ravi Verma represents a scene, uh, the scene of uh, King Dushyanta proposing to his beloved Shakuntala from the classic play of Kalidasa uh, called Avigyan Shakuntala. Verma had dressed his uh, protagonist in Indian attire as prevalent in the 19th and 20th centuries. So the romantic embrace of Dushyanta and Shakuntala amidst a naturalistic setting with Shakuntala's pedo lovingly looking at the couple might echo the European convention of a conversation piece. Nevertheless, this play is full of references to how animal world brought the couple closer. And in particular, how Shakuntala's departure was lamented by animals in the hermitage of Sage Kanva, that is her foster father. So let me move on to the next slide, please. So as I move on to this final uh, image of my presentation, let me briefly introduce uh, something uh, which I have grown up reading basically. So in 1945, the climate of war, in amidst the climate of war was published Bengali novelist Premendra Mitra's science, science fiction series called Ghanada. So uh, Mitra was an anti-fascist himself and the first story of this Ghanada series, as we know in Bengali, was titled as Mosha. So Mosha literally means mosquitoes in Bengali. And this uh, story was set in 1935, presenting the protagonist Ghanada, uh, alias um, Ghanashyam Das, as saving the world from the evil plans of Japanese entomologist uh, Nishamara, who, was, uh, who created a genetically modified mosquito as part of biological warfare. The core of such representation lay in altering the salivary glands of the mosquito. So as Ronald Ross had actually pointed out in his Nobel lecture, it was the salivary gland which secretes the irritating fluid which the mosquito injects in the wound made by her in the skin, perhaps to dilate the vessels, thereby perhaps to prevent speedy coagulation of blood. The exact root of infection of this great disease, which annually slays its millions of human beings and keeps whole continents in darkness, was revealed. These minute spores enter, the minute spores here means the parasite, enter the salivary glands of the mosquito and pass with its poisonous saliva directly into the blood of man. Never in our dreams we had imagined so wonderful a tale as this. The idea of the salivary glands of the mosquitoes as playing an effective role in infection had thus fed into cultural consciousness, which again is illustrated on a postage stamp from Bangladesh, erstwhile Pakistan, following the independence and partition of India in 1947. In this image, the needle named uh, malaria er eradication pierces directly into the salivary gland of the mosquito, thus hinting again at the aim of uh, generating wider awareness of the anatomy of mosquitoes. So to conclude my presentation today, uh, the study of images can be productive in three ways. First, it can help challenge the Eurocentrism of global order. Secondly, global knowledge order. Secondly, such an approach can strengthen our understanding of the scientific, uh, of how scientific endeavor can be both a product as well as reflective of the class-based gendered and uh, racialized differentiation. And finally, dealing with imagery can potentially bring onto the surface multitudes of skills and expertise that have hitherto being lost within the celebratory canon of science and modernity. The Wellcome Trust's digitization of images is vast in its range and scale. 
a testament to Henry Solomon's own elaborate strategies of collecting. Digitization is of extremely good quality because it allows a, for a closer look at uh, the images uh, present online. However, when thinking of the prospects of post-colonial digital humanities, scholars like Rupika Rissam have pointed out that digitization should, be, should stay wary of reproducing the colonial hierarchies of domination. And many of the artifacts in the West museums and repositories have troubled histories. Lots of them are not supposed to be within museum spaces in the first place. In this context, it is important to acknowledge the historical and cultural context of the images and materials digitized as part of the metadata. So welcome collections image search function has a very useful feature of uh, basically pick, picking up related images when putting in uh, keywords for image searches. I'm not an expert definitely on the technical side of things, but such an approach I believe would be more useful if related uh, to the if related cultural aspects can be linked with images or as a first step made to feature within the metadata, linking uh, thinking largely in the context of intangible heritage, basically. So uh, Welcome has already in place these directions for sensitive content, which I think makes more sense when it comes to uh, non-European artifacts. This, however, has to be more than a statement of warning, st statutory warning, welcomes uh, physical exhibition has done remarkably well in both these directions and will not uh, and it will be very good to see this being taken forward in the digitized versions as well welcomes attentiveness to non european languages is very praiseworthy i would personally love to see this being brought into the context of images as well so non european images which are an asset of the welcome collection uh, are kind of representative of the medical diversity, medic diversity of the social and cultural context within which uh, like healing cultures and medical uh, sensibilities develop um, in different parts of the world. So, and this is something that medical education has recently started to take into account. So something uh, like tradition, the ineffectiveness of traditional medicine is often highlighted as like something to legitimize and justify the role of Western medicine. And people are kind of through critical medical humanities and also like changes in uh, the way medical education happens. These things are now increasingly being questioned. So which is definitely a great step forward. So. Um, this approach of uh, like uh, bringing in languages in the context of images can help make the Europe non-European voices appear with the respect and appreciation that they deserve without being subsumed into uh, wider European narratives. The final point that I would like to make the make is that of community involvement. So I already saw that. Uh, William had uh, laid out how like there would be a uh, feedback uh, to go after like a feedback form that would be sent uh, to visitors after like to uh, like listeners or visitors sorry we haven't like we haven't gone back to in person quite as yet so to listeners uh, after the seminar so welcome strategies of uh, basically free high quality exhibitions are really valuable in terms of public history and the images as my presentation has hopefully shown, can make the collection more public facing. It is important that the voices of the public are attended to through online fora, like they can comment if there are, if uh, Welcome can think of possibilities of involving like people's comments on ex like on uh, artifacts or uh, images that are made on like are avail made of available online. Especially uh, this effort will especially make sense in my opinion at a time when uh, the traditional forms of museum displays are being made increasingly open. So such an approach I believe will not only help in making our communities more sentient, but will also ultimately contribute to a better uh, research culture and of course like a better future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aperba, for a very original synthesis of a wide range of materials, uh, which I was very interested to hear about. Um, we've come a very long way since the pioneering works of Mildred Archer on oriental scenery and company drawings, and uh, I agree that 
Indian export works is a, is a much better term, uh, enabling us to get away from the inherited terms. Um, recently, of course, Doug, Douglas Fordham wrote his book, Aquatint Worlds, but I mean, that's only one strand in, in your talk. Um, the Aquatints, which kind of some, of, some of which present a kind of uh, tourist's view of India or, or English armchair tourist's view of uh, what they would think um, India is supposed to be like. Um, but you've, you've um, expanded and critiqued that and provided a, a context for it. Um, I was, I mean, thinking about malaria, I mean, it's a very complicated disease. There are many stages in its etiology. You don't just, something hits you and you get it and that's it, and then you recover. Um, uh, there's the, there are the pools of water that gather on dustbin lids or in open dustbins and, uh, and the mosquitoes, and then there's the, the parasite and with its life cycle. Um, uh, inside, outside the body and inside the human body after it's been bitten. So, so it's incredibly difficult to understand. I mean, even today, it's a kind of, it must seem kind of a very nebulous sort of experience to some people. And so one would think that the identification of an actual physical uh, animal, the, the mosquito and the, the parasite by Manson and Ross, uh, must have made it uh, much easier for a kind of public relations aspect mm -hmm. to communicate. But if there was no native Indian tradition of kind of natural history depiction of mosquitoes or insects generally, then w would that not just be kind of an yet another imposition of an alien culture uh, upon the indigenous people? And so it wouldn't have any effect, or maybe it did. What do you think? It's definitely a very, very interesting question. And uh, obviously, like, uh, I'm more inspired by this question, like, as I, because I have just started my project. So, uh, like, taking it forward, this is something that I would really think about as I basically get a chance to do the archival work properly. Well, Indian did have the tradition of, uh, like, visually representing insects. We see that a lot in like, for example, in Mughal paintings, there are traditions in there. And uh, in ancient Indian epics, insects have a very, very prominent role. For example, Mahabharata is full of, in, like full of instances how an insect basically changed the fate of a great man. So like Indian culture is full of uh, like instances where uh, like these non-humans, like even as small as insects, have held huge agency. So I think that kind of potency is something which is very, very interesting to take forward. And then how visual culture basically picks up on that, because something that I actually encountered during my research for this talk, as well as for my wider project as such. So Babar Nama, so the first Mughal emperor in India, Babar Nama, Babar basically criticized everything about India and Indian environment. He didn't even mention mosquitoes once in the context of India, which was very surprising for me. He mentions mosquitoes in the context of Kabul and uh, how it is problematic and how it is so disturbing, but he never mentioned mosquitoes even once. Jahangir mentions mosquitoes just once, like he they went hunting in central India, but had to give up the campaign immaturely because obviously due to the due to mosquitoes and things like that. And that's where that's where it ends. He doesn't 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 really Take it up much. So this is something which is worth investigating, definitely. And your question obviously inspires me to think more closely about the subject. Uh, I can't see any uh, other questions in the chat, but I would just uh, thank you for your comments on how we could improve the, the welcome catalogue, because we're always thinking about new ways in which to do it. Yeah, I mean, if you were uh, uh, the director of the Welcome Trust and you could give any order you liked as to what we should do to improve it, uh, how, what would be most useful to you in terms of adding additional context? Um, like, uh, well, as I al always say, because Welcome Collection has been like really, really helpful for my own research. Like I have been marveled at like the scale of digitization and also the very high quality of digitization, which was very, very useful to me as I did my like research, my PhD research, and then I'm also doing my current research. It's very user friendly. So the context in the sense of like, for example, the Gibbons, uh, the stamp from the Gibbons catalog, which was part of my last slide. So the translations, like obviously the 
the, the, the name Pakistan appears in like three different scripts. So just acknowledgements of these small things. This is just a very small instance. There are like other uh, like things where there are like uh, the question of language comes in. So these kinds of like a little bit of attention to details like regarding the diversity of languages, scripts, because languages and scripts have like cultural meanings and, and then like performative aspects. For example, welcome has like scrolls in place. And uh, like many of these scrolls are like were used kind of, uh, they were a surrogate, like they predated the age of cinema. So they would be unfolded uh, like uh, one by one in order to reveal a narrative. So like, and these, uh, some of these artifacts, West, non-Western artifacts have uh, like a performative aspect as well. So I know like, this is like, it's easier said than done. It's very expensive to bring all of these aspects together. And I'm fully aware of that, but just a hint of like how uh, a product, uh, how uh, an artifact might have uh, like, meant within the cultural context from which, which it is from. It's like this act of situating. If we could take that further, that's just uh, something that I thought might be useful. Yes, thank you. I think we all agree with you. And uh, we'll, and I'll pass that on, thank you very much. We have a very interesting question uh, about the agency of landscape, but unfortunately we are at time at the moment. So I will forward that uh, question to you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so uh, we will we'll record any other questions that come in during the session and we'll send them on to you in due course and we'll send out an email to all attendees uh, with your responses. So thanks once again for such a fascinating seminar, Apurba. Thank you uh, for having me. To everybody else, I'd say look out for details of forthcoming events on the uh, exploring research of the about the exploring research series on the events page at welcome collection and that's it for this afternoon so goodbye thank you thank you thank you <laughs>